make it just on seven, so I might make a start. Um, and first of all, welcome tonight and for coming along. And my name is Brian Firth. I'm a Buteyko practitioner. Now, Buteyko is a very difficult word for people to say, um, let alone um, spell. Many people think it's a Japanese word. It's actually a Russian or Ukraine word. The surname of this gentleman here. If you want to know how to say potato, you just say potato and put a but in front of it and you're not too far wrong, okay? In fact, my daughter says to me, Dad, are you going potatoing tonight? And I say, yes. First of all, a little bit of history on who potato was and more importantly, what his discovery was back in the 1950s. Uh, how he struggled for recognition with this discovery for over 30 years in the Soviet countries and how the method got out to the Western world and lucky for us, the first country that it came to was here in Australia in the early 90s. Um, now I'll talk about um, my own uh, history struggling with these conditions and that of my family and tell you a little bit about the media that have featured the success of the Potoko method both on the tally and in print. Now when you first hear that simply by changing the way that you've come to breathe you can have such profound improvement in your asthma, in your sinusitis, shortness of breath, sleep problems such as snoring and gasping, and disturbed sleep, anxiety symptoms. Just by changing the way that you breathe, it is a little bit hard to accept. So I will go through the scientific basis of how and why the method works and so that you can understand why your body gives you these particular conditions. Now some of you may know that to do the Potato course of breathing retraining for your own health. It actually is a course that takes five sessions, usually over five consecutive days. This is actually the first session of the course. However, I want you to treat today's um, session purely as a free seminar. There's no obligation to go any further. Um, I'll give you a lot of information today, but I'm also gonna do some practical work with you as well. So hopefully you can go away and start to make some changes and hopefully get some improvement. And in particular, I'm going to give you three strategies that uh, you can try tonight to help improve your sleep. So, Bateko was this Russian doctor. He, was, he, he made this discovery when he was doing his third year of his medical studies. He was given a not very pleasant assignment. The assignment was to observe people dying. Not very pleasant at all. And he sat by these poor souls' beds for months and months and months recording, observing. And what he discovered was that just before the onset of death, people's breathing rate deeply increased. And this is not what he expected. He expected the poor souls to just, their breathing just trail away and then just stop. And he started to investigate this deep breathing, wondering whether it had anything to do with diseases, because after all, people die from diseases. And what he found was if people were able to reduce the depth of their breathing, some very positive things started to happen. They were able to control symptoms such as breathlessness and wheezing. They were able to clear and breathe through their nose. They were able to sleep soundly at night without snoring and gasping. And over 120 different conditions, he believed, including in some cases, hypertension, high blood pressure. Now just to explain what his discovery was, if you're feeling sick, you're feeling crook, and you're bad enough to go along to see a doctor, you know that a doctor will ask you lots of questions and, um, uh, and you know, probably measure a whole lot of different things. He might measure your temperature, your pulse, your blood pressure, your blood pressure, all kinds of different things. And if you're out even a little bit with some of those things, it can make a big difference to your health and how you feel. And the doctor might suggest some medications, lifestyle change, whatever, to correct. Well, there is a normal way to breathe as well. And the way that they measure breathing is with something called the minute volume, which is the volume of air that a person breathes every minute. Now, just like the textbook tells us that these are the normal ranges for these simple body measures, um, a, normal, a healthy adult should be breathing around four to five litres per minute sitting at rest, such as you are. But what Potato discovered, and what's been backed up in these clinical trials in Australia, New Zealand, and the 600-person clinical trial in the UK, is that all of us with these respiratory conditions actually breathe at a rate around three times what is normal, around 14 litres per minute. 
And it's this over-breathing. The technical term is hyperventilation. The Pateko discovered was the actual root cause of why people get asthma, the root cause of why people get hay fever, nasal conditions, the root cause of sleep problems such as snoring and apnea. And what we seek to do in the Bateco course is to apply the method that he also discovered to correct the way we've come to breathe over all these years. It's, it's made up of a, a series of uh, education, subtle lifestyle change and breathing exercises that corrects this way we've come to breathe. Um, resulting in an improvement in symptoms usually in days, less need for medications, an increase in your ability to do physical exercise and less dependence on drugs and machines. Now currently Western medicine, our good doctors, don't recognise this over-breathing unless it becomes extreme and the symptoms have really kicked in. And of course they think it's the triggers that are the cause of asthma and hay fever. So we're expected to rip up the carpets, don't go outside in the springtime, stay away from people wearing perfume or smoking, and take medications simply to reduce the symptoms. Or in the case of snoring and sleep apnea, we're expected to wear uncomfortable devices in our mouth or machines on our masks on our face for the rest of our lives simply to reduce the symptoms of the problem. But as you're probably aware in life, if you don't attack the root cause of a problem, then the problem usually doesn't go away and often the symptomatic treatment can cause a new problem which is just as bad as the first. So just to make it perfectly clear what I've said here, what I'm saying is that the reason why you might get asthma, the reason why you might get nasal problems, the reason why you get hay fever and the reason why you snore or gasp or stop breathing at night is because you've come to breathe too much. Now, when I first heard this over eight years ago, um, and I suffered from asthma, chronic sinusitis, blocked nose, and sleeping problems for over 40 years, I came along to one of these seminars and someone was standing up the front telling me I was breathing too much. I found it very, very hard to accept because whenever I was in trouble, whenever I was struggling, I always felt I wanted to breathe more, not less. But the way I describe it now to people was if you think as to when was the last time that you um, perhaps suffered with a bit of shortness of breath or wheezing or you observed somebody who was struggling with an asthma attack or you, you woke up gasping at night or you observed someone snoring, because of course we don't ourselves, do we? Observe somebody snoring at night. If you looked at the way they were breathing at the time and compare it to the way that I'm breathing right now. See, we usually don't have too much trouble. We're able to breathe calmly and gently through our nose. Often it's a lot of heavy chest movement and certainly often breathing through the mouth. So just to go back to Bateko's discovery again um, and give you a little, fill you in on a little bit of history, what happened back in the um, late 50s and 60s was um, Bateko looked around and found he was really right out of step. Everybody at the time was experimenting with um, increasing breathing, deep breathing. And you still hear it today. You'll hear people tell you to take a deep breath. But when he had overwhelming evidence, he put together all his evidence and presented it to his peers and superiors, expected to be wildly applauded and nominated for a Nobel Prize. Now, this isn't what happened. His colleagues were stunned by his claims. How could you treat diseases with anything other than drugs and surgery, they said. And it was actually another 30 years of struggle before he was actually fully recognised in the Soviet countries. And the reason is, a bit of a long story, but the main reason is that life was pretty difficult in the Soviet countries through those years. Uh, people were concerned about uh, fundamental things such as food on the table and a roof over their head, let alone coming out on a winter's night like this, listening to some bloke like me talk about breathing for a couple of hours. Okay? But it was finally fully endorsed. In 1985, there's a chronology over here in, the, in your newsletters. 1985 was the first endorsement under ministerial order um, of the Bateko method as the first line of treatment for people with these respiratory conditions. So towards the end of the 80s, in 1990 actually, um, a couple of Bateko's colleagues decided they wanted to get the method out to the Western world. And the first country they chose to come to was Australia. And the reason why they chose Australia was 
Well, several reasons. First of all, Australia seemed like a nice, good, free, open, democratic sort of country. Good place to bring medical innovation, which you may or may not agree with, but compared to Soviet Russia, I'm sure that's the case. The other reason is Australia has one of the highest incidents. Australia and New Zealand has one of the highest incidents and death rates in the world from people suffering from asthma. And Australia actually leads the world in the treatment in the treatment of these sleep disorders. So a gentleman by the name of Alexander Stelmatsky, the author of this uh, dark blue covered book here, he's, he's written another one on, on sleep and insomnia. Um, Alexander Stelmatsky's name was or known as Sasha, came to uh, Sydney, started working um, and started uh, training people in the Bateko method. And slowly people started to go along to these, these breathing courses, having I mean, their breathing retrained. And words started to get out. People were able to clear and breathe through their nose for the first time in their lives. They were able to uh, control symptoms such as asthma and wheezing and re reduce their need for medications. They were able to sleep soundly through the night with more energy, not gasping or snoring. And words started to get out. What was this new method? You know, is it going to be available to all the people? You know, what the and pressure started to build on the medical authorities to have a position. And the pressure increased when the TV station started to pick it up. And uh, the first program featuring the success of the Potoko Method was, was screened on a current affair in about 1993. And in the first two years that Sasha the Russian worked in, in Australia, at testimony he taught between 1,000 and 2,000 people. And there were no less than 11 different TV programs featuring the success of the Potoko Method. You may be surprised to learn that since the early 90s, there's now been over 45 TV programs screened on Australian television featuring the success of the Botoko Method. Has anyone ever seen it on telly? Yeah, there was one this year on What's Good For You, you know, that program on Channel 9. And there wasn't much last year, but there was about five the year before, mainly on snoring and sleep apnea. A lot of the original ones were on asthma. Anyway, the, f the, the, the pressure built and the first trial in the Western world was held on the Botoko method. It was held in Brisbane at the Mater Hospital. It was done with asthmatics initially. Uh, 40 people were chosen. The average length of time that they had asthma was 19 years, so these people were serious asthmatics. They were divided into two groups of 20. One group did a standard Botoko course with Sasha the Russian. Five sessions over five days of roughly 90 minutes, very similar sort of structure that we use to still do today. And the other group were given standard asthma education and management by a trained respiratory physiotherapist from the Queensland Asthma Foundation. And after um, 12 weeks, the two groups were compared. And the pe people who did the Botoko course reported their need and use of uh, reliever drugs had reduced by 92%. For those of you not familiar with uh, asthma, these are the puffers that people take when they can't breathe. Their need and use of preventive medication had reduced by 49%. They had a 71% reduction in all symptoms. And both groups were asked to compare quality of life parameters. And the main quality of life parameters they were asked to rank were the amount of coughing, the amount of mucus produced, the quality of their sleep and their ability to do physical exercise. And all the people who did the potato course reported a great improvement in their quality of life. The people who did the standard asthma education and manager, very similar to what's still done today, how to take the drugs correctly, all that sort of stuff, monitoring them over the time, well, they had no change in the amount of medications they needed. They were still taking the same volumes that they were at the start. They had no improvement in symptoms, and they reported no improvement in their quality of life. You're probably all sitting there thinking, well, gee, if this happened over you know, 12 or 13 years ago, how come we don't hear more about the Botoko method? And how come we don't hear it from our doctors? Well, at first, there was lots of news. There was lots of things written up. Um, there was lots of um, media. Uh, doctors gasp at Botoko's success was written up in um, the Australian doctor. Study explains success of Botoko. Botoko OK trial finds asthma hope in method. All this positive media came out. But the medical authorities are very conservative. They're very slow to change their practices. They were a bit overwhelmed by the results. They certainly weren't expecting them. And um, Charles Mitchell, who headed the uh, study, said, look, I think we should do more research before I start recommending um, a change in the way that we manage these conditions. Fair enough. So the call went out for more research, bigger trials and so forth. 
And the sad fact is it's now 2007 and there hasn't been hardly any other medical research done in Australia, virtually none, in order to change people's minds. And I don't know whether you know much about medical research and the reason why this may have happened is because medical research tends to be an expensive and competitive business. Lots of people would like access to very few funds. And the funding for medical research tends to come from the companies involved in the current forms of treatment. So you're not going to get a pharmaceutical company investing in medical research to prove that you, know, you don't need as much of their medications. Similarly, in the area of sleep apnea and snoring, you're not going to get a company investing in medical research to prove that you don't need they're expensive machines for the rest of your life. They're not in that business, really, are they? But when you look at the cost of the health budget in Australia, let alone the cost on people's lives and the absolute scandal that people actually still lose their lives because of asthma in Australia, why the government hasn't stepped in and done more completely defeats us. But then again, you won't be surprised to hear that we, have, we live in a world that's not that perfect and uh, our health system isn't that perfect. But that's the bad news. There is a, some good news, and the good news is there has been a large clinical trial held not in Australia but in the UK, and it features this um, lady by the name of Jill McGowan. She was a Scottish nurse uh, who specialised in this, these respiratory conditions. She suffered with asthma herself. She used to take the nebulizer three or four times a day. Uh, she was one of the first prescribing nurses in, a, in, in England, sort of halfway between a doctor and a nurse treating people with these conditions. And when Sasha the Russian left Australia after five years and started working in the UK, she was recommended to go along um, to learn about this by a doctor. And she resisted it. What could this Russian teach her about? She was the expert in this area. But finally she went along and she was amazed at her improvement in such a short space of time. And then she realised, of course, that this is the way she'd been treating people all these years wasn't the best way and that working class people wouldn't get access to this method unless doctors would recommend it and they can get it through the national health system. So she put together the protocols for a large clinical trial. She worked in universities and she applied for funding. 600 person clinical trial. She applied for funding one year, two years, three years. And every year she got knocked back. And the reason why she got knocked back is because the funding comes from the same places. And when they figure out what the funding's for, the research is for, they think, oh, we'd rather invest in something else, perhaps. But she's a very determined lady. She did an extraordinary thing. She sold her own family home to raise the capital to invest in the medical research herself. Um, she raised about £50,000, which was a reasonable amount of money, but 600-person clinical trial wasn't a cheap business. And this gentleman here, Paul O'Connell, went over and worked on a voluntary basis. He's one of my colleagues in Melbourne. He worked on a voluntary basis training practitioners, as did Russell Stark from the UK, the author of that other light blue book there. Training practitioners so the 600 person clinical trial could go ahead. Now initially the 600 people were divided into three groups of 200. Because you're going to need to have control groups and all this kind of thing. But eventually the whole 600 people were given access to the Botaco method. And the results were even better than uh, in Australia. 98% um, reduction across the board of all need for reliever drugs, 98%. 92% uh, reduction in preventer medications. Now the reason why it was better than in Brisbane is because this study was done over two years. Uh, more time for people's, the inflammation in people's lungs to recover, or more importantly for their immune system to get stronger and stronger. Now, as a result, a number of good things happened, not all the ones that we hoped for, I suppose. But some of the good things that happened was that Jill was nominated and won an award. She was nominated for uh, the Pride of Britain uh, Care of the Year Award and another award called the Great Scott Award, which she subsequently won. And here she was receiving her award at a large ceremony, a bit like our Australia Day Honours type thing. And lots of other things have happened since, but uh, this is just a little indication, otherwise we'll be here all night, a little indication of of some of the, the struggle for recognition that we've had. Just a, a little mention about Paul O'Connell before I go on. He's one of the first people to be trained by, um, uh, by Sasha the Russian in Australia uh, back in the uh, mid-90s. He suffered from uh, asthma and, and sleep problems for over 30 years. And in his late mid-30s, mid he uh, happened to be in Adelaide on uh, holiday and happened to 
be in a motel, and as you do, you just turn on the telly, and here was the, one of these current affair programs. And so he wrote down the name, and when Sasha the Russian came down to Melbourne, where he lived, he did the course with a large group of people. And he was amazed at his transformation in such a short space of time after suffering all these years. And he followed up the other people in the course as well. And then he went back two years and followed up other people and all, also found that it all had sustained improvement. So Paul and a group of others decided, rather than try and change the world, which we can't, he and a group of others formed the BIBH, the Taiko Institute of Breathing and Health, which is the professional body that controls us, the practitioners. And they self-funded a number of other clinical trials with the same terrific results. But of course what we need is not only uh, a few clinical trials, we need truckloads of money to publish this to every doctor's clinic, to every, uh, you know, to every uh, hospital, to every clinic, to every school, to every community centre, so that people learn more about it. And what you'll find if you speak to your doctors, the doctors will say, oh, you've heard about it. If you happen to have a sleep doctor, they'll say, oh, I heard about it. I think it works well for asthma. If you happen to have an asthma doctor, they'll say, oh, I heard about it. I think it works well for sleep, you know. So it's going to take a while. Let me tell you a little bit about my own experience, how I got involved. I suffered, as I said, as a child with asthma. Um, asthma wasn't that bad. It was mainly the, this block, this chronic sinusitis I had. Now, um, as a kid, I'm at an age before these Ventolin puffers were out. So I used to take a pill to help my asthma. Didn't know what it was, a little pink tablet. I used to take it, it used to make my heart race. Okay? It was very important for understanding where we're going here. So it used to help my asthma. Now, cats and dust was always a bit of a problem for me. And I used to get a lot of cold. No, I didn't get a lot of colds, but what I did get a lot of was just about every second cold I got, I couldn't shake off. It would develop into a more serious condition called a chest infection or bronchitis. This is where you try and shake off a cold and you end up you're just all shivery and weak. You go to the doctor. The doctor asks you some nasty things about what you're coughing up and says, well, look, you know, you need antibiotics and take time off work and study. It's just to happen to me like clockwork just about every 18 months, despite being relatively, what I thought, relatively fit. So anyway, <coughs> it all started to change for me when I was 16. I was going through my last two years of school at boarding school. I was at Assumption College Kilmore up the road. Now, have any of you got any relatives in Kilmore? Good, it's a cold, miserable place. You know. Especially in the 1960s, it was a cold, miserable place. Now, they used to make us play sport every night out on the fields, rain, hail and shine. And, I, and one night I was out there playing hockey, chasing that hockey ball, and I was sickening for bronchitis. So I wasn't too swift. And I was looking for that hard white ball, and I looked up and I finally I found it. Bang! It hit me right between the eyes, smashed my nose, responsible for that proud lump just there. And I was whisked off to the Kilmore Hospital where they gave me painful penicillin injections, you know where, for the uh, bronchitis. And the surgeon set the nose. Now the surgeon that set the nose, he said, look, you've got all this congestion, all this blood. Did you know that you can have a nose operation? Clean out your nasal passages so that you can breathe. So next year in Preston at Panch Hospital, um, I had a nose operation, age of 17. I don't know whether you're familiar with this, it's a very invasive operation. Anyone here ever had a nose operation? Sister had. Okay, it's about right. Yeah, usually about a third to a sixth people who come. Okay, this is quite an invasive thing. They give you drugs to make even my big nose even bigger. They go and drill out all the passages, okay, and they stuff it full of about a metre of gauze up either side. And then, um, you know, when it heals, they give you morphine and they take it all out. Incidentally, your mother, I was 16, your mother comes to visit you and takes one look at you and starts crying. Thank you very much, Mum. Anyway, they give you morphine and they take it all out, all heals up, and you're supposed to be able to breathe, which I could for five days. And then kachunk, it all came back again. So I went to uni, became a high school teacher, and I worked at Flemington High School right next to the race course for 10 years, 1975-1985. And by now, I'm in my 20s, I wasn't getting much asthma because I wasn't running around much. But uh, by now, I had myself a Ventolin puffer, and it was fantastic. If I couldn't breathe, I'd just have a squirt of this, and instantly my air tubes would open up. But pretty soon, I found I needed two puffs, and three puffs, and four puffs, and more and more. And once I got caught without my medication, got very anxious, very stressed, very upset, and got, had a massive attack. Ended up in St. Vincent's Hospital, where they gave me strong injections, which made my heart race. It probably saved my life. Now, during my 20s, I started to get these sleep problems. Now, it wasn't that I couldn't go to sleep. I slept okay, but I was falling asleep during the day. 
I'd have a meeting at the school in the afternoon at 2.30, bang, I'd be out. At night, I'd go home and have a meal, fall asleep, and I was only in my 20s. Now, back in those days, we're talking the, uh, you know, the, 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 the mid-70s and late-70s, nobody talked about sleep apnea very much. Uh, I was told I snored, but everyone snored. We used to laugh about snoring. Remember when we used to laugh about snoring? We don't laugh about snoring so much anymore, do we? So everyone put down my condition, my problem, to anxiety and stress. Believe it or not, it was quite stressful working at Flemington High in those days. We had the first lot of, remember what we used to call the boat people coming from, from Southeast Asia, and we had quite a melting pot down there, and, and uh, I had a lot of responsibility. Believe it, look, many of my students, I love them very much, one of them is my accountant today. So it was quite stressful. After 10 years, I left teaching, got a job in IT. I put on a suit and went into town. By now, I had a young family growing up. And I was renovating my house in Essendon, and we noticed that uh, my son, Thomas, each year he would sneeze more and more, uncontrollably. He'd come outside, I was planting my native plants, as we always used to do then, and he would just have a look at a plant and he'd start sneezing. We'd give him drugs for it, you know, pills, but you don't like your kids taking tablets. But what can you do? Worse still, his younger sister, Amy, had, um, had, in, had seemingly inherited my asthma. And unlike Thomas, she liked to play sport. And every time she ran around, of course, she, um, she got an asthma attack. And it was very upsetting. She had all the drugs, she had the Ventolins and the Beckler Forts and all those sorts of things. You don't like your kids taking drugs, but what can you do? I used to get phone calls constantly from the school. Amy's had another asthma attack. Come and get her. And I'd come up to the school, she'd be upset, she couldn't join in, they'd be nuking her with drugs and her heart would be racing. And, and it was very, very frustrating. And it used to really annoy me. I know that doesn't sound rational, but uh, oh, I felt very frustrated. Here was my kid having this thing and there was nothing I could do but give him more drugs. And it used to really get to me. It was bad enough being sick myself, but when my kid was sick like this, I just really, it really used to eat at me. So I was determined to find out all I could about it. So the next thing I tried was the allergy immunity skin test. I don't know whether you're familiar with this one. This is where you go along to a so-called allergy specialist who pricks your skin with a whole lot of different chemicals. A bit of cat, a bit of dog, a bit of plant, a bit of pollen, you know, a bit of food, all these different things. And if the little prick goes red, they say, aha, you must be allergic to that particular chemical, whereby they come up with the idea of giving you a course of injections in this poison. The idea being your body will, immune system will get used to it and you won't react. It's actually a very dangerous practice if you think about it. Here's something your body doesn't like, and they give you heaps of it. It's not done in most countries around the world. It was cut out for a long time in Australia, but it's come back again. We, so we get everything here in Australia. <laughs> okay. So I put my 11-year-old and myself through this course of injections over weeks and months, and we had no improvement whatsoever. So I went back to the specialist, what's the story? They said, oh, sometimes it doesn't work. Said, oh, great. So what do I do now? He prescribed another, yet another brand name of one of these Cortico, inhaled corticosteroids. So by now, I'm going up the corporate ladder. They're letting me loose in front of customers. I'm talking to customers on the phone. And I always do it with me. Okay. I'm presenting to large corporates, half a million, quarter of a million dollars worth of software. And I've got this block snotty nose the whole time. It wasn't good. I'd take the Claritines, but I'd get a bit of temporary relief. But when it wore off, I'd come back, I'd have a rebound. It'd come back with a vengeance. So it was really starting to get me down, so I decided to go back to the doctor. The doctor referred me to the specialist. The specialist looked up my nose and said, what you need is a nose operation. Clean out your nasal passages so that you can breathe. I told him, look, I, I had one of them, you know, I, I, didn't, I wasn't too... Oh, he was adamant. He said, you've got a deviated septum, I do them all the time, I'll book you in for next Thursday. So I went home and had a big think. This guy's a specialist. He's the expert here. What, you know, I've got to take these people's advice. And maybe, you know, surely medical science had advanced in 20 years. So I went back and had another nose operation in my late 30s. And I'm here to tell you that medical science had advanced. Instead of um, a metre of gauze up either side, I had these fancy plugs that they put up now. But I had the same results. A week to 10 days and kachunk, it all came back again. So by now I'm getting into my early 40s, I'm starting to be a bit concerned about my, 
you know, my fitness, my health and my weight, I thought, gee, I'd better start exercising a bit more. So I joined the gym. I uh, started playing tennis again. Started, someone got me into bike riding, long distance bike riding. I was doing this big bike ride round the bay in a day every year. And gradually, my condition got much, much worse. Much worse. I was really struggling. At night, I would wake up four times, gasping for air. I'd nuke myself with about four puffs of Ventolin, and I'd get myself right, I'd go back to bed, two hours later, bang, I'd need it again. Now, of course, we, we didn't think it had anything to do with exercise, because exercise is supposed to be good for you, isn't it? Well, it turns out it's not that great for you if you don't do it correctly. And the other thing is, <coughs> well, what we thought was, I was living in a suburban house with, uh, in Melbourne with ducted heating, blowing the dust around all through the winter. And in my house I had two cats and a hairy German Shepherd dog, which my family adored. So everyone figured it was the allergens that was my problem. So it was clear, either the cats and dogs went or, well, they weren't going anywhere, I'm afraid. So I was shelling out money for someone to come and clean out the ducks every other month, someone else to shampoo what was left of the carpets, expensive coverings on the beddings and the pillows, and I was getting worse. So I went back to the doctor, as you do. And the doctor said to me, Brian, it's time for your medication to go south, stronger. What could I do? I was in trouble. So he prescribed for me this little pill called Pradisolone. Some of you may have heard of it. It's a uh, little white tablet. It's called an oral corticosteroid. Oral because you take it as a tablet, as distinct from inhaled. It's actually a very good drug for people with respiratory conditions. However, it has very severe side effects. The main one's been a great increase in appetite and subsequent weight gain. Easily bruising of the skin, slow to fix and repair any cuts and abrasions, hair loss, stomach ulcers, osteoporosis. Not very pleasant side effects, of which he didn't tell me about at all. But what he did tell me was that this drug was very strong. And I couldn't just take it for a week or so. And if I got better, stop taking it. Because in that short period of time, it would replace my body's own ability to produce the hormone cortisone, a vital defence. And if I stopped taking it, I would have none. And if I had an attack, it would be severe. And I got a little bit, you know, I don't know whether I want to go down this path. I thought, gee, this is pretty serious, you know. Do I want to take, I'd always been very conservative with medications. So anyway, I got the prescription made up. I was quite naive too, this is about eight years ago. I now know there are many medications you have to wean yourself off, okay? But at the time I just thought, whoa. So I got the prescription made up and I left it on the sideboard. I didn't take it and I suffered for a couple more days, a couple more nights. And I was just about to give up and I opened up the paper and here was an ad for one of these Potato seminars. So I rang him up. I said, what's the story? He said, oh yeah, just got to change the way you've come to breathe. And I said, oh yeah, sure. After all I've been through, it can't be that simple. He said, you know, it's not that simple. But he said it was based on something called the Bohr effect. He said, it's in all the medical textbooks. Look it up. Learn a bit about it. And I did. And I encourage you guys to look it up as well. It's easier today to look up things because we have something called the internet. And if you put in your Google the words bore space effect, and you can have a bit of a read about it. So I looked it up, I read a little bit, didn't understand it all, but I decided to do his potato course. And after the second day, I was able to clear and breathe through my nose for the first time in my life, and keep it clear. And on the Wednesday, I went to bed, instead of waking up four times needing medication, I only woke up once needing medication. And on the Thursday, I slept through the night, I was told I didn't snore, I needed no medication at all, and I woke up with more energy than I'd had for years. And that was pretty much the end of my problems. I had to continue to work on the method and, and apply all the little techniques until it all became automatic and my breathing became more normal automatically. But eventually I was able to go back to my doctor and come off for my preventer as well. And that was eight years ago. And looking back in those eight years, uh, I haven't had any asthma at all, I don't have any medication, I haven't taken any medication. Um, I go to bed way too late. I drink far too much red wine. Never wake up 
tired or with a headache or any of those conditions. And, um, <clears throat> of course, I put my two kids through the course as well. Thomas no longer sneezes non-stop for six months of the year. Shocking hay fever. He, we don't have any tissues in our house that he can leave in his pockets on laundry day. You know? And Amy doesn't have any asthma at all. She doesn't take any medications whatsoever. Okay? She plays lots of sports. She's now 20. She joins the gym. And she doesn't have to put up with any of these conditions. So yes, I did very well on the Botoko course, but it wasn't without some effort. It does take a bit of effort to change the way you've come to breathe over all these years. And I was given a number of challenges. But the main challenge that I was given, the biggest challenge, most important challenge that I was given, is the same challenge that I give you people that come along to these seminars that I run every week. And the challenge that I'd like to give you is what I'd like you to try and do for the next 24 hours is only ever breathe through your nose. Now, you're allowed to speak, right? You're allowed to eat, you're allowed to drink, but the rest of the time, I'd like you to have your lips sealed, breathing only in and out through your nose. Now, so I'd like you just to observe yourself, see how you go. Now, why don't I suggest this to people who come along to these seminars? Most of you are all sitting in the chair, you think, mm, what's the big deal? That's not that hard, you know? But most people fail the challenge the minute they get out of their chair to walk out the door. Mouth comes open. You go outside and the cool air hits you. <laughs> Mouth comes open. You reach over to pick up something, do up your shoe or whatever. <gasps> and what about when you eat? Are you one of these people that eats air and food at the same time? <gasps> what about when we brush our teeth, wash our hair? Most people find this impossible when it's first suggested to you. So I'd like you just to observe yourself. And what about when we go to sleep? If you ever, during the night, wake up with a dry mouth, if you make frequent trips to the toilet at night, if you have any coughing, um, wheezing, congestion at night or in the morning, if you shake or shudder in your sleep, if you snore, if you gasp or stop breathing with any apnea at night, if you ever get restless leg syndrome, if you get leg cramps, often in the early hours of the morning. And the final one is, I suppose, no matter how early you go to sleep, no matter how many hours you spend sleeping, you still wake up and find yourself tired and sleepy during the day. All of these things indicate incorrect breathing. And you would get fantastic improvement in a sh very short space of time by addressing the real cause with the potato method. So yes, I did very well. And as I said, that was eight years ago. And looking back in those eight years, I haven't had any, as any asthma medication, any medication really at all. Um, I, uh, I no longer snore. I go to bed way, way too late. I drink far too much red wine. And I never have a headache. I never, I'm never tired or sleepy during the day. And looking back, I hardly get any colds anymore. I do get the odd sniffle, but you know, I haven't had bronchitis once, not once. I used to get it every 18 months like clockwork. And I put my kids through. Thomas no longer sneezes non-stop for six months of the year with hay fever. We don't have any tissues in our house that he can leave in his pocket on laundry day. And Amy doesn't have any asthma at all. She doesn't take any medication whatsoever. She's now 20 and she's got the rest of her life not having to put up with these conditions. She plays lots of sport. Now, Amy was about 13 when I discovered this. Thomas was about, I don't know, 15 or 16. And they've got the rest of their young lives, hopefully, the rest of their lives not having to put up with these conditions. Not only the particular condition they had at the time, but all the other conditions, the energy and the sleep and the hay fever and all the rest of it. I was 45. I don't have as much time left as they do. <laughs> But what time I do have left is no comparison compared to what it was like before. We just don't know, you just don't know what you're missing out on, you know? So what I did over the next couple of years, I kept working in uh, IT. I worked for IBM for a while, for, but I was always intrigued by this because I'd worked hard with my kids and I, was, I felt so rewarded that I was able to be able to change all that and control things. 
So about four and a half years ago, I started stu studying to become a practitioner. Training to become a practitioner. It took me two years part-time. And, um, and during those two years, I had to observe 70 people going through a Boteco course, case studies in the works. And two and a half years ago, I became a full-time practitioner. And this is all I do, all I've done for two and a half years, 40 weeks a year. I've personally taught over 1,300 people myself. And what I find these days is that most people who do Boteco today do it for, specifically for snoring and sleep apnea. Most people, 70%, still a good 30% of people with asthma, sinusitis, anxiety, chronic fatigue, disturbed sleep, but most of them for snoring and sleep apnea. One of the reasons is the rise of treatment of sleep apnea and also the, the increase in the incredibly strong drugs for asthmatics who have their asthma suppressed, think they're okay. And the amazing thing about seeing all these people is when people learn, learn to breathe normally, everybody gets better. So let me explain how it works. When you breathe, we breathe the air. Eh? Now the air that we breathe, the air in here, is made up mainly of nitrogen. Now nitrogen is what's known, 78% is nitrogen. Now nitrogen is an inert gas. Inert just means it doesn't do anything. 21% of the air is oxygen. This is the key gas we humans need. We need oxygen for the growth and regeneration of all of our cells and tissues. It's vital. But there's another gas involved, carbon dioxide. In the air, there's virtually none. There's such a small amount, it's almost negligible. 0.03% carbon dioxide, tiny amount. However, in our bodies, in our lungs, we need to have at least 3% carbon dioxide in order for us to be alive, and as much as 6.5%. As it turns out, the more the better. Now, if we have this if we have this much higher proportion on pressure of the gas carbon dioxide in our bodies, in our lungs, and there's none in the air, then clearly we must produce it because we can't get it from the air. And we do. It's part of metabolism, respiration, particularly when we exercise, we produce more carbon dioxide. And many people kind of think this, many people kind of think, oh yes, we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide which is a bit of an oversimplification, we actually breathe out heaps of oxygen as well. Otherwise we couldn't give people mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. So what happens when you breathe? When you breathe, you drag this mixture called air into your lungs, finds its way down your bronchial tubes, the little sacs at the end of the bronchial tubes, the alveoli, and there the gases exchange into our bloodstream. Then our heart does the right thing and pumps the oxygen, the blood with the oxygen to all of our cells and tissues. The way this works is with something called haemoglobin, chemical symbol Hb. Well, it's actually the protein that the oxygen binds with in order to be transported around our body. The whole molecule is called oxyhemoglobin, and we've literally got millions of these molecules in our red blood cells transporting the oxygen around our body. Now, it's all very well to have the oxygen bonded to the haemoglobin. But what we need to happen is for the bond to break easily and efficiently so that the maximum amount of oxygen gets to all our cells and tissues that our body craves. Now, what determines how well this works was discovered by a Scandinavian scientist called Christian Bohr around the turn of the century, 1900, 1907, something like that. He discovered that there is a connection between the amount of carbon dioxide in a person's lungs and how easily the bond breaks, and more importantly, how much oxygen ends up getting to all your cells and tissues. The more carbon dioxide we have, the more easily the, more easily the bond breaks, and so the more oxygen we end up getting. Now, for people who over-breathe, remember this? <laughs> all of us with these respiratory conditions. What happens you, when you breathe three times what is normal, is your body ends up with low levels of carbon dioxide. So there's no gas in the air, there's no pressure of carbon dioxide gas in the air, there's much higher pressure in our body. We, our body leaks it uh, and loses it. It's called the bohr verigo displacement curve. He worked on it with an Italian guy. Uh, and they gave it a special name called the Bohr effect. So put more simply, the Bohr effect states this. In order to get more oxygen, we need to retain more carbon dioxide by breathing less. 
I just said you'll all get more oxygen if you breathe less. Doesn't sound right, does it? Breathe less, get more oxygen. Is this guy crazy? Everyone thinks if I breathe more, I get more oxygen. Well, does deep breathing give you more oxygen? It certainly gives you more air, but does it give you more oxygen? Well, there's a good way of understanding this, perhaps. I don't know whether you've ever experienced or ever observed anybody who deep breathes to excess. Have you ever observed or experienced anyone have a, 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 an anxiety or panic attack? <gasps> they breathe like this, they lose control of their breathing. <gasps> now, if it gets serious, they, <gasps> their heart starts leaping out of their chest, they get very stressed. Often they think they're going to have a heart attack. <gasps> their toes and fingertips get tingly, <gasps> they get dizzy, and if they don't stop, they faint. We know why this happens. The tingling is a lack of oxygen to the extremities. The, the dizziness is a lack of oxygen to the brain. And the fainting is the next step. And some of you may know that there's an old-fashioned but very effective remedy for somebody who has a hyperventilation attack. What is it? You get a paper bag. It doesn't have to be brown. You get a paper bag and you place it over the person's nose and their mouth and you get them <laughs> to suddenly breathe into the paper bag. And when they breathe into the paper bag, that what happens is that the paper bag contains their breathing and, and, and slows down their breathing and controls their breathing a little bit better. So when they slow down their breathing, they start to retain more of this carbon dioxide that they're hyperventilating off. And when they retain more carbon dioxide, due to the Bohr effect, their body gets more oxygen. They recover. They get control back. They don't faint. So we use this example so people could understand. Does deep breathing give you more oxygen? The answer is no, it gives you less. But the whole ignorant world out there is going to try and tell you to take a deep breath. Don't go taking a deep breath, it's not good for you. Especially if you've got these symptoms. So let's put all this together and see how it affects and how our bodies give us these different conditions. Let me start with nasal conditions. A little while ago, I asked you to try and breathe through your nose the next 24 hours. And most of you have been very good. I've been watching you. Okay? But for many of us, it's just a matter of remembering because we've been breathing all these years and we never think about breathing. You know, it's an automatic thing. Okay? We've just got to remember. But a lot, of, a lot of us, it's difficult to breathe through your nose because we get a blocked nose. Yeah? Now, I'm going to teach you. This is the practical bit I was talking about. I'm going to teach you now the correct way to clear a blocked nose so that you can breathe through it. I'm going to explain it, I'm going to demonstrate it, then I'm going to ask you all to give it a go, whether you've got a blocked nose or not, because the next 24 hours you might get a blocked nose, and you need to know the correct way to clear it. Because guess what, blowing and blowing is not the correct way. But that's all right, lady, I'll let you... <laughs> OK, so the correct way to clear a blocked nose is to breathe in and breathe out, and then to hold your breath. Hold your breath after you breathe out. Now, that's unusual. In life, what happens when we hold, whenever we do hold our breath, we tend to breathe in, hold our breath, jump in the swimming pool or jump in the shower or whatever. Eh? Not with potato. We hold our breath after the out breath. So, in a minute, you're going to breathe in, breathe out, and hold your breath, and then hold your nose to make it easy. Otherwise, it's too difficult. And then, this is a bit looks a bit silly, you're going to gently nod your head like this. Gently nod your head. Okay. The reason why we nod our head is to bring the blood with the oxygen to the affected area. It helps. Okay. So at first when you're doing this, it's fairly easy, easy. I want you to push on. This is the one exercise we want you to push on. Hold your breath for as long as you can and then a couple of seconds. Okay. The longer the better. The one exercise. So you push on, push on. Now it starts to get a bit harder the longer you hold. You're pushing on, you're pushing on. Now, finally, I absolutely have to breathe. Then this is critical. You must... You must keep your mouth closed. Keep your mouth closed. And keep it closed, OK? Um, recover through your nose. Now, there's no sense in doing this and going... Oh, wasn't that funny? <laughs> OK, because you'll undo all the good work you've just done, OK? So, let's give it a go. Sitting squarely in your chair, get a hand ready. Breathe in through your nose if you can. 
Breathe out. Hold your breath and hold your nose. And gently nod your head. Gently nod your head. Now, at first it's easy. I want you to push on. Do it properly. Push on. Push on as far as you can. Push on. Push on. Push on. Push on. But remember, when you absolutely have to breathe, absolutely have to breathe, push on for as long as you can, then a couple of seconds, okay? Push on, push on. But when you finally have to breathe, keep your mouth closed. Put your finger over your mouth, keep your mouth closed. Now, I'm going to be a bit of a broken record here. You need to keep your mouth closed, okay? Keep your mouth closed. Keep your... I should hear the breath. Okay. All right, just with a show of hands, who felt a bit of clearing when they did that, a bit of improvement? Very good, very good, very good. Okay. Can anybody tell me why people get blocked noses? Any idea? You get swelling of the membranes in your nose. Is that what you said? Yep. Yep, that can happen. Why does that happen though, I wonder? They don't blow their nose enough. Some people never have to blow their nose though. Why do some people have to blow their nose in the first place? That's what I'm saying. <clears throat> yep, some people grow polyps, in the, uh, which blocks up some of their nostrils. That's, that's true. And often when they have operations to get them cut out, they grow back again. Why do they grow, I wonder? Sinus. Yeah, sinuses get infected, inflamed. Sinusitis is inflamed sinus, is infection in the sinuses. And that can be caused by a virus or it can be caused by a reaction to maybe an allergen or chemical or something like that. The membranes swell up. Now, obviously, when we get a cold, our body produces more mucus when we get a cold as part of the defence. But, of course, some people have a blocked nose chronically, don't they, all the time, some people. Well, let me give you a different reason why this happens, one you may not have heard before. Believe it or not, the reason why people get blocked noses is because they've come to breathe too much. And when you breathe too much, what happens is your body ends up with low levels of carbon dioxide. So if you're breathing like this all the time, there's no carbon dioxide in the air, much higher pressure in our, in our body, and the gases leaks. It ends up being low levels of carbon dioxide. Due to the Bohr effect, which we've known about for over 100 years, the, our body's not getting the right amounts of oxygen. The oxygen sticks in the blood. Now, the human body craves oxygen. Craves oxygen. But the human body is a fantastic thing. It always tries to self-correct. So you're breathing in a certain way that causes you not to get the right amounts of oxygen, so your body tries to stop you from doing that. And one of the ways it does it is blocking up your nose, which is where you're supposed to be breathing, or growing nasal polyps, okay, to stop you from doing it. But we feel this blockage, and what do we do? We sniff, or we blow our nose, or we cheat, and we open our mouth, and we breathe through our mouth. There's nothing our body can do about that. Believe it or not, the reason why we uh, get a blocked nose is we've come to breathe too much, and if that's the case, we're probably breathing through our mouth. Now, many years ago, let me tell you a little story of you. Many years ago, in the 90s, when the Bateco method first came to Australia, uh, one of my colleagues tells a story about a lady that she had. Now, remember, back in the 90s, most people came for asthma. That was mainly it. And all these people came for asthma and a lady with a young boy went home, came back the next day and with the young boy and signed up to do the course. And she said to my colleague, look, an extraordinary thing happened last night. She said, I've got another young boy at home. He's 10 years of age and he's got this terrible condition. It's called chronic and severe sleep apnea. Have you heard of it? She said to my colleague. And he said, yes. This poor kid has got this shocking intense blocked nose and they've done everything to try and clear it. The poor kid can hardly function. Ten years of age, he's had two operations like I described before, before the age of ten, the poor kid. No success. Um, then they decided to sterilise the whole place. So they got rid of all the carpets and drapes and everything and tried to get everything, you know, get rid of all the dust and the allergens. Still no improvement. Then they had to go to the garden. They got paved everything, took all the gardens and plants away. Still no improvement for this poor kid. Then someone came up with the bright idea, of course, that they should shift to a different climate to help this poor kid. So they did. They sold up and they moved. Still no improvement for this kid. And then we knew what she was going to say. It took two or three goes of doing that exercise, but she got this kid's nose clear. 
And she was happy and she was sad. She was happy because she finally got this poor kid's nose clear, but she was sad because she worked out that her and her husband had spent probably $130,000, $140,000 trying to get this kid's nose clear, let alone all the disruption and the trauma and upset. Five minutes of potato and the kid's nose was clear. But here's the thing. It takes me five minutes to teach you the correct way, the correct way to clear your nose, but it takes five days to retrain the way a person's come to breathe over all these years so their body won't keep blocking it up again and again. And it takes five or ten minutes to explain to you about asthma and hay fever, but it takes five days to retrain the way a person breathes so their body won't keep giving them those conditions. And it takes, you know, ten minutes to tell you about snoring and sleep apnea, but it takes five days, just five days, to totally turn around your snoring and sleep apnea, so you'll never need to use one of these machines for the rest of your life. So, if you happen to be driving around the eastern suburbs of Melbourne over the next couple of weeks, maybe Roeville, Knoxville, you know, Ferntree Gully, even down as far as Frankston, you know, and you're driving along in your car and you happen to notice out of your corner of your eye, some bloke on the side's going like this. <laughs> you know, he's come along to one of these seminars but haven't been able to fix the problem permanently, okay? So I'm going to talk about asthma uh, for a little while. So if you're here for sleep apnea and snoring, never had asthma in your life, hang in there. And if you can follow the asthma story, you'll be able to follow better the sleep apnea story because the way we've been treating asthmatics in Australia for the last 30 years with our fantastic record, I don't think so, is the way we're going down the same path with people with sleep apnea and snoring. If you can understand one, you'll understand the other. So asthma. Now often when we talk about asthma we focus on these triggers. It's the cat, it's the dust, it's the pollen, it's the perfume or whatever. But all these things are, are just chemicals that get into our bloodstream or it's the exercise. They're just things that make you breathe more because when these chemicals get into your bloodstream what happens is they put your system under pressure because they react with your body chemistry in some way and we're all genetically different. I actually didn't like cats and dust but I quite like perfume, we're all a bit different. And these chemicals react in such a way that puts your system under physical pressure and whenever we're under pressure, either physical or emotional for that matter, our body goes into defence mode and our heart rate increases and our breathing increases. The two things always go together. So these things just make you breathe more. Now that's okay. But if you happen to be an over-breather <coughs> with low levels of carbon dioxide, you, you come in contact with something that makes you breathe more, and that puts you into the danger zone. Your body's not getting oxygen, so your body reacts. Now, for people who have asthma, Basically, all people with asthma are over-breathers. This number, 14 litres per minute, um, comes from the 40 people in Brisbane. It comes from the 600 people in the UK. Every asthmatic is an over-breather. Now, you, sure, if you get asthma or hay fever, you, you may be born with a propensity for asthma. Some people are born with propensity for asthma. Some people don't get asthma, but they get something else. They might get sleep apnea. They might get something else. Let me tell you this. If you over-breathe, breathe incorrectly, and your body's not getting oxygen, and it gets to the stage where your body's critically not getting oxygen, your body will self-correct in one, one, of, one of four ways. It'll either squeeze up your nasal passages, giving you nasal conditions and sinus conditions. It'll squeeze your bronchial tubes, giving you asthma. It'll squeeze your throat at night, stopping your breathing with apnea, perhaps. Or it'll squeeze up your whole throat and mouth, giving you anaphylaxis. Or it'll wake you up and disturb your sleep, trying to stop you from breathing like that. They're all treated in the same way, with dilation, drugs or machines or, some, or drugs to, to stop your body's response without addressing the cause. So the person with asthma is an over-breather. When you, when you breathe too much, you've got lower levels of carbon dioxide. Your body's not getting the right amounts of oxygen. But at the moment, I might be OK. I've got drugs in me. I'm OK. Right? But suddenly I'm triggered by coming in contact with something that makes me breathe even more, or I run. <laughs> and when it makes you breathe more, it pushes you in the critical stage and then you have an asthma attack. What happens is the smooth muscle wrapped around the bronchial tube. Now that's another thing you can look up if you want. A smooth muscle, involuntary muscle. I haven't got time to go into it today, but this is why this affects so many other conditions in our body. The smooth muscle squeezes around the bronchial tube on the asthmatic and they can't breathe. So what does the asthmatic do then? Try harder to breathe, of course, and pretty soon we're... 
And whenever we're breathing heavily and hard like that through our mouth, we're not very far away from needing a puff of our Ventolin or our Bricanol, our reliever medication. So we take a puff and at first it's fantastic. The drug chemically relaxes the smooth muscle and the bronchial tubes dilate, open up and the asthmatic can breathe. <sighs> but pretty soon we find we need two puffs or three puffs or four puffs or more and more and more. Well, the problem with this form of symptomatic treatment is that you need to understand how all these reliever drugs are based. All these blue reliever drugs here, they're all known as adrenal. They're all basically adrenal. They're all based on adrenaline. And everyone knows what adrenaline does to you. Adrenaline makes your heart rate increase and causes you to breathe more. The two things always go together. It's the hormone that surges through our body as our body's most basic form of defence. Whenever we're excited, whenever we're nervous, whenever we get a fright, whenever we have to act, or whenever, whenever we're even sick a little bit, we, our heart rate increases and our breathing increases. But hang on, I just said the cause of asthma in the first place is that you breathe too much. Could it be the very drugs that give you relief have a major side effect of keeping you breathing too much or making you breathe more? And thus, you need more and more and more. And this was highly suspected. All around the world where these drugs were out for 10 years or more, the death rates went like this. And so clinical trials were done to prove this. And the main ones were done in Canada and New Zealand. And what they tested was, would taking just three puffs a day of a short-acting bronchodilator, Ventolin, would it make the person's asthma get better, remain the same, or get worse and they needed more and more and more? And the overwhelming evidence was that these people needed more and more. And all this bad press came out about the asthma drugs. Ventolin puffers harmful. Are asthma drugs a cure that kills? Another headline reads. Wrong approach comes under an asthma attack. Ha ha ha. Asthma sufferers often careless. Asthma sufferers victims of indifference. Asthma worse in teen girls. All this bad press came out about the asthma drugs. So, in Australia and the UK, the National Asthma Campaigns were formed. This was media. If you, needed, if you need three or four puffs a week, go back to your doctor who's supposed to know about all this research. And the doctor would then prescribe for you, if you needed this much, preventer medication. And what the preventer medication should happen is that if you've got any asthma symptoms where you need three or four puffs of this stuff a week, you should be on preventer medication all the time. And what the pre preventer medication does is it sits in your lungs and it reduces, it reduces inflammation in the lungs, one of the vital um, symptoms of asthma. So you have an asthma attack and if you've got preventer in you, it's not as bad. And so you don't need as much of this reliever stuff. That's the theory which is going to make you worse. So just to explain, the BIBH, the Tokyo Institute of Breathing and Health, the professional body that controls us, the practitioners, what our... What are our approaches to medications if you do the Botaco course with me? Well, you stay on whatever medications you're prescribed by your doctor. But when it comes to asthma drugs, the world's best practice is this. That people should take their preventer medications all the time as prescribed by their doctor. But you should only ever take reliever drugs only for relief. But many people don't take their drugs that way. You know, only when you need them. Many people take them several times a day. You know, whether they've got it or not, to try because they think they're stopping it, come. In the short term it will, but inadvertently, long term, it'll weaken you and weaken you because of the side effect. And, make, and require more and more and more. Many people take a puff of this drug before they take the preventer, because the theory is this will open up their air tube so the preventer will get in. How ridiculous is that? Some packets even tell you to do that. Many people... Um, don't understand. Many people tend to overuse these drugs, okay? And what compounds all this is if you go, you can go to a chemist in Australia and buy Bricanol or Ventolin over the counter, you know, without a prescription, thus encouraging the overuse of these reliever drugs. Now, what other countries can you do? It's Australia, New Zealand, certain Asian countries. Guess which countries have the highest incidence or death rates in the world from asthma? Same countries. What a coincidence. Now, look, I'm not bagging people who do that. I used to do it myself. We think we're stopping the asthma response coming in the short term, but long term, we're making us weaker and weaker. And many people don't just understand it. 
I was talking to my barber in Mooney Ponds. You might not think he's such a good barber, but I don't think he's too bad, you know. Anyway, last year, he was cutting my hair. And I said to him, do you get any asthma or hay fever? He says, yes, Brian. He said, I've got the, I've got the blue one, I've got the green one. He said, I don't take the green one, it doesn't work. Now, I'm not bagging for not understanding the way these drugs are supposed to work. Many people are like that, okay? Now, what happens is we tend to overuse these drugs, inadvertently making us worse. Now, very quickly, Cuvar, Flixotide, Pulmacort, Alvesco, inhaled corticosteroids, a synthetic version of our body's natural hormone, cortisone. Should be taken regularly all the time if you have any asthma symptoms. Prednisolone is the stronger version, the tablet form that goes through the whole body, and this is if you have a more severe condition or you come out of hospital, you have to step down through prednisolone. Intel, Tylade and Singulair and a few others are non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. Often people go on these if they don't like the steroid word. Um, it's a little bit, uh, they don't work as well and a little bit misguided because these steroids actually are quite good for people with respiratory conditions. Ventolin, Bricanol, Asmol, Aramir, basically the same drug, Selbutamol, just different brand names. Bricanol is slightly different. Short-acting bronchodilators designed to chemically open up your airways for up to four hours. Um, Atrovent and Spiriva, the tablet form of Atrovent and Spiriva, uh, usually prescribed for people with bronchiectasis, emphysema, to soak up mucus as well as open up the airways. The nebulizer is the pump delivering large volumes of Atrovent mixed with Ventolin often. Not used much anymore, sadly still with children, mainly because of these new drugs, Cerevent and Oxus. Cerevent and Oxus are called controllers. One puff of Cerevent or Oxus is equivalent to between 8 to 12 puffs of Ventolin. This drug is called Selbutamol. This drug is called Selmeterol. Mega. Same drug, much stronger. So they know these drugs are very strong. So they insist that people be on Preventer at the same time. But sometimes people don't take their drugs regularly. Sometimes people can't be trusted to take paper. Sometimes people don't understand. So the medical authorities, in league with the drug companies, have come up with this new type of medication called Combination. Serotide from GlaxoSmith and Simbacort from AstraZeneca. And you could be on either one of those. And people, asthmatics have been putting, put on this in their thousands and thousands in Australia. Uh, and I've written them in the two colours because serotide contains very, very, very strong Ventolin reliever as well as Flixotide at the same time. Simbacort contains very, very strong Ventolin, Oxus and Pulmacort. So how can you take your preventer or regularly and only take the reliever when you need it? You can't. People take these morning and night. And when they first go on this, people think, oh, this is great, you know, I'm not, I don't need any Ventolin anymore. Little do they know that if they're taking two or three or four puffs of this, they're taking 10, 20, 30 or 40 puffs of Ventolin a day, the equivalent of that. And all the side effect and weakening their immune system at the same time. Now, people go on this, oh, I haven't got too many um, uh, asthma symptoms, but then people start to get more susceptible to colds and flu and pneumonia. People start to get these uh, lung infections, uh, fungal infections, aspergillosis, pseudomonas, I see people with. They're on permanent antibiotics now for the rest of their life to try and get rid of that. Or asthmatics start to get a condition that an asthmatic never, ever used to get. Asthma, people who got asthma never used to get this condition. It's called sleep apnea. Because now their asthma is so suppressed with all these strong drugs, their, their cause is still there and it's got worse, so their breathing's bad at night and they get sleep apnea. Asthmatics never used to get it because they used to wake up with asthma first when they, when they breathe like this. If you're here to overcome your asthma, your sinus, hay fever, any of those conditions, I can help you by addressing the real cause. And the real cause is the way you've come to breathe. So what we do is to start to retrain the way you breathe. It takes five sessions over five days. It involves a number of breathing techniques, exercises to recondition your body's acceptance of more carbon dioxide so your body gets more oxygen. It's also some subtle lifestyle changes and we teach you the correct way to take your drugs. You stay on your preventer medications and you only take your reliever medications as required. When you get a bit of an attack though, 
we teach you some breathing exercises to do and if, if you don't need it, then you don't need to take it. And what people find is very quickly though, as they start to improve their breathing, their symptoms really reduce. It's common for people with asthma to reduce their symptoms by 90% in the first week. If you're on these drugs, we coach you how to go back to your doctor over the next couple of days or whatever and uh, get a prescription, tell your doctor you're doing Bateco, we'd like to be treated in the old fashioned way, get a prescription just for the preventer medication and Ventolin or Bricanol and very quickly we can start to improve this. You stay on your preventer until your breathing rate gets really, really, really good as we start to measure from the day Tuesday and then when you've had no asthma for a month or more and your breathing measurements are really good, you can go back to your doctor and say, look, I haven't had any, how do I reduce my preventer further? And you, you halves it again and eventually you can come off everything like hundreds, thousands of people have done since the early 90s. Now, hay fever is just a similar form of this. As I said, it's triggered by a chemical that makes you over-breathe. You start to um, breathe more normal volume, use your nose more, filter out most of these allergens, end up with more carbon dioxide, more oxygen. You're still affected by these things, but they don't push you into the danger zone, and you just don't react. Now, um, so, that's asthma. Let's talk a little bit about sleep, but before we do, there are four reasons why you should breathe through your nose, not just because I asked you to. The first reason is, our nose is a fantastic filtration system. We have hairs and sinus passages designed to trap all the allergens and dirt and, and impurities that our lungs don't want. Our lungs like it sterile, because anything that hits your lungs gets straight into your bloodstream. So if it's going to react with anything, it's going to get in. Our nose is a fantastic filtration system. The second reason why we should breathe through our nose is our nose warms and humidifies the air. Our airways don't like being dried out. If they get dried out by excessive laughing, excessive um, barracking, excessive talking incorrectly, then the airways will dry out, your body will lubricate with um, mucus. If you keep talking and drying them out further, then you hear <coughs> people start croaking up. Okay. People who are trained in Bateco breathing very quickly learn that when they speak they should be able to breathe out through their mouth because that's what speaking is and breathe in and rebreathe the air in through their nose. Now the other thing that happens when you dry out your airways is people get this very easily reactive, this chronic cough. You hear people who cough uncontrollably, <laughs> this really shocking cough regularly for every, sometimes some people do it every 10 minutes for years. Chronic cough through the dry airways. The third thing that when we get a cold, our body produces mucus, reacts with enzymes in the walls of our nose to kill bacteria. And the final thing our nose does is, see even my big honk, compared to my even bigger mouth, it regulates the volume that we should be breathing. Okay? When we bypass our nose and breathe through our mouth, we bypass this fantastic filtration system. Mouth breathing is largely responsible for just about all ear, nose, throat and chest infections that people get and certainly responsible for all the orthodontic problems that kids have. Now, um, I've had, I have several dentists around ringing me because they've got these new therapies with young kids, uh, eight years old, to try and shape their, their teeth before they, so they can avoid having, having bands. And it just won't work if they're a mouth breather. My son no longer has hay fever, but I spent a fortune fixing his teeth, absolute fortune. He had to have operations to line it all up again, everything from his years and years and years of mouth breathing. A guy in a dentist in Townsville rings me up and says, thank God you're finally coming to Townsville, because I used to go to Cairns and Mackay. I'm a, I'm a mandibular dentist, whatever it is. And he said, you know, all these kids I see, and it's all their mouth breathing. Nobody knows how to change the way they breathe, except you people. So, so there are the, some reasons. Now, at the start of the seminar, I said I'm going to give you three strategies to help improve your sleep, how they come. These are the things I want you to try tonight. You might like to try tonight. And they're all designed to reduce your breathing at night naturally. Because guess what? I'm going to tell you that the breathing rate is the cause of your problems at sleep. And the first strategy to reduce your breathing at night involves posture. Now, people with asthma or sinus conditions or know anybody with, may be familiar with this, but when we lie down, the further we lie down, the flatter we are, the harder and heavier we breathe. The more upright we are, the gentler and, and less we breathe, just naturally, okay? 
anybody who's ever had any asthma or um, an attack, you know, an asthmatic, if they've got a bad attack and they can't breathe, they don't go to bed. You don't go and lie down. It makes you worse. Often you get it at night. They have to prop themselves up, you know, prop themselves up. So, the first strategy is don't lie flat when you sleep tonight. Sleep standing up like this. I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> get a bit of elevation, okay? So, don't lie flat. Get yourself a pillow. If you've already got a pillow, you might want to try two. Or, or just have them overlap like that. Put a shoulder on the bottom one and a head on the top one. Don't give yourself a stiff neck. If you've got two, you might want to taper three. But try not to give yourself a stiff neck because if you get pain, your heart rate increases and your breathing increases, okay? Apart from the discomfort. And what we suggest to some people who are doing the course for a short period of time, you might want to elevate the bed on a few um, uh, bricks or yellow pages at the bottom of the head of the bed, just to elevate, give it a bit of incline. You don't have to change your pillows that way. Okay, and you get a bit of incline. Now, if, however, if you sleep with a partner, that involves negotiation, which could be stressful, of course, couldn't it? Okay, <laughs> all right. So, for a short period of time. Second strategy to reduce your breathing tonight is to breathe in the correct position. Sleep in the correct position to reduce your breathing. And the correct position is on your left-hand side. The order of preference is your left side, your right side, your stomach, and a long, long last is on your back. Whatever you do, try and stay off your back if you can. When we're on our back, all your internal organs crush our breathing pump, the diaphragm, thus making it harder work and heavier breathing. Or worse, and worse still, when we're on our back, almost automatically, automatically our breathing increases because our mouth comes open and the volume of our breathing goes way up. Now, left side's better than your right because your heart is actually on your left-hand side. And when you lie on your left, everything fits together better. Your heart doesn't work as much. Whatever your heart does, what your breathing does. On the right, it hangs slightly, so it works a bit harder. But it doesn't really matter. Left, right, stomach, it doesn't matter. Just try and stay off your back. Second strategy. Third strategy, now, you know, don't you, that people, not you, people, not you, snore louder, not you, snore louder when they're on their back, don't they? Okay, all right, so the third strategy to improve our breathing, to, uh, or to try and get some improvement by reducing our breathing tonight, is to breathe through the organ designed for breathing, breathe through our nose at night. But this can be a challenge, because breathing is one of those things that's actually automatic. And we have control over breathe, our breathing when we're thinking about it and when we're awake. But when we're not thinking about our breathing or we're asleep, we don't have control. We breathe the way we've come to breathe over the years, and that's the problem. But what you can do tonight to give yourself a chance of a bit of improvement is get your nose as clear as you can before you go to bed tonight with that exercise. Breathe out. Hold your breath for as long as you can a few times. Keep your mouth closed. Get it as clear as you can. Now, a human breathes between 25,000 and 30,000 times during a 24-hour period, they tell us. It's a lot of breathing, isn't it? Most people like to sleep between four hours and as much as I don't know, 10 or 12 hours. 12, oh, that's a bit too much. Eight to 10 hours, maybe even. Now, without doing the mathematics, that's a lot of breathing where you don't have control because you're asleep. And there's a huge difference between gently on your side, breathing through your nose, compared to being on your back hour after hour, <laughs> like this. Okay, hour after hour after hour. <clears throat> and what happens when we breathe at this heavy, high rate is one of the first things that happens is we make a noise. And the noise of someone's breathing when they're asleep, I think, is called snoring. That's what it is, the noise of someone's breathing when they're asleep, yeah? <coughs> now, snoring is often the butt of many jokes. People laugh about snoring. People ring me up and say, oh, I snore the roof off. Uh, I snore like a pig, they say. Ha, ha, ha. But when you can't sleep in the same house with somebody, let alone the same bed, because of the noise of their snoring, it ceases to become a joke very quickly. And we've got people all over the country sleeping in separate rooms with their, to their partners because of the noise of snoring. And people go to extraordinary lengths to try and overcome the snoring. And there are many, many things you can do. But I'll cut to the chase of the two most significant things. The two most serious things are people can have an operation. People can have the palate trimmed, 
or soft pellet trimmed. Have you heard of this? Anyone had that operation done? Anyone know anybody that's had it done? Okay, it's not very pleasant. If you put your tongue on the roof of your mouth, it's hard. If you push your tongue further back, it gets a bit floppy. And that's the thing that, that flaps in the breeze when you make that noise, okay? There's a uvula there. It's called lasering, trimming the soft palate. Let me tell you, it's very, very, very painful to get over. It takes ages to get over it. And you know what? Most people have no improvement at all. And they get very angry. And from the Botaco perspective, it just advances your problems because it takes away some of the resistance to the over-breathing. And worse still, what happens is, why do you have a soft palate? Because when you eat and drink, it's got to help it go in the right direction. People have it all trimmed and they've got all these problems when they drink and eat and everything. It's a terrible thing. Don't let anybody convince you to do that. The second thing that you can do is you can get a mandible splint, a mouth device. Anyone heard of this? Anyone got one? Uh, had it suggested, yeah? People had, it, had people heard of this? You heard of this? Okay, a few of you. This is like a mouth guard, top and bottom, moulded to your bite, to your, to your teeth, okay, like a mouth with a hook in between. Now, it's moulded to your teeth from a dentist, so we're not talking cheap, we're talking dollars. Dentist dollars. They sort of go together, don't they? Dentist dollars, okay? And... Um, uh, so we're talking 1200 bucks, maybe as much as two and a half grand, I've heard. And anyway, they've got a hook in between to lock it together and rubber bands involved. And it's called LJA, Lower Jaw Advancement. You can look through all this stuff up on the web. And what it has, when you put it in your mouth, it moves your lower jaw full, advances your lower jaw. Okay. And what that does, by moving the lower jaw forward, it opens up the gap at the back. And so the vibration isn't as bad. So you can get an improvement in the noise of snoring. Okay? But what happens is, if people can use these things, it can, it can reduce the noise of snoring. But what most people do, they get it home, they pay the money, they wear it for a couple of nights, and it's not very comfortable, let me tell you. Like this every night. And they get migraines, they get sore. Okay? So they just don't wear it after a while. So they've done their money. Or they do use it, and they persist and persist. And then it might take six months, might take 12 months, might take two years, but after a while it doesn't work as well. It's starting to make more noise. And the reason is, guess what happens to your jaw with all that pressure and the bands every night, hour after hour, your jaw actually moves. This is the way orthodontics work, the bands, yeah? And it moves, and so it drops at the back, and so you, you, know, so you know what they do? They crank it up. I've had people that had it adjusted three times. One guy in Sydney did the course with me. He'd had his uh, mandible device adjusted three times. He now spoke with a permanent lisp. And he did potato because he was wondering when his lower jaw was going to hit the steering wheel. I mean, it's funny, but it's not funny. When you fix a problem with a, with a um, um, symptomatic treatment, you can cause a new problem, which is worse than the first problem. There's, look, there's only one way to safely overcome snoring. Let me first of all tell you what causes snoring. Here comes rocket science. You ready for rocket science? Snoring is caused by this, the heavy rate of breathing. Breathing heavily causes the noise of snoring. Look, I'll demonstrate. I'm breathing now. Can you hear me? Say no. Okay, watch. Here we go. I made noise, didn't I? And I did it through my nose. Okay? Imagine through your mouth. It's the heavy rate of breathing that causes the noise. Things get in the way. The only way to permanently overcome snoring is to retrain the way your body's come. There's nothing wrong with, with breathing like this. There's nothing wrong with breathing heavily like that, providing it matches your activity. If you're running around the block, running up and down the stairs, you should be breathing hard if you're at the gym. But this is at rest. Now, at night, when you're laying in your bed sleeping, you're not running around the block, are you? You should be breathing gently. But over the years, we've come to breathe, and we breathe this heavy rate. Now, the only way to correct this is, the only way I know is with the Botaco method. The only way anybody knows. In fact, if you go to doctors and specialists, say it's impossible to change your breathing. I beg to differ. This guy, Botaco, worked out a way. It takes five sessions over five days. It starts by changing the way you breathe during the day. Using your nose, clearing your nose, resetting things. And, you know, 
That's why we keep his name, this difficult name that I have to spell all the time and pronounce and all that sort of stuff in honour of this gentleman. It changed my life and so many other people's lives. And it takes five days, five sessions and 90 minutes. It starts by changing what you do during the day. The way you breathe during the day carries over to what you do at night. It starts by clearing your nose and breathing through your nose correctly, trying those things at night. And very quickly we have other techniques to take it even further. And we can get dramatic improvements with snoring. If you snored that loud last night, by tomorrow night I can have it down to either 30% or just about silent. That's how dramatic an improvement we can get. Now, <coughs> you have to keep applying the method and the thing so it all becomes automatic, but that's how soon we can get some dramatic improvement, naturally. Now, you might say, well, what's the point of doing this great long course just for snoring? Everyone snores, don't they? How can you change that? Well. Let me tell you, if you do the potato course with me this week just for your snoring, you'll turn your life around from going directly in the direction of loud, noisy snoring, sleeping in separate rooms from your partners, dry mouth, feeling pretty lousy, yucky, more mucus and all that sort of stuff in the morning. And then it gets worse. So it starts to now affect the quality of your sleep. So now you're tired during the day as well, despite, you know, sleeping for hours. You're now sleepy, you can't concentrate, you're a danger to yourself and others on the roads. Plus, you're more, oh, now you're off to the sleep clinic and the dollar's involved there. And then you've got a CPAP machine, replacement mask, and on and on for the rest of your life. You're more prone to colds, flu, hay fever, bronchitis, all these other conditions. You'll turn your life around to sleeping and, sleeping and breathing quietly. Maybe sleeping with your partner again. Okay? Uh, getting a better quality sleep. Never, ever, ever going near all that sleep clinic rigmarole stuff. Um, more energy during the day. Better sporting performance. Less prone to colds, fever, uh, hay fever, bronchitis, all these other respiratory conditions. More energy. Now, snoring leads to a more serious condition called sleep apnea. And apnea is a Greek word meaning pause. And pause is where we stop for a short period of time. People with sleep apnea stop breathing for a short period of time, many times during the night often. And often the person with sleep apnea isn't the first person to detect it. Often it's their partner. They hear all this noise during the night of snoring and suddenly there's silence. And there's a gasp. And there's a noise of snoring and there's silence. And there's a gasp. And they become concerned. My partner has stopped breathing at night. Are they going to start breathing? Start breathing, please. So fortunately, they always do. And the person with sleep apnea starts to feel it because they've got the quality of their sleep. It may not be sleep apnea. It might be just disturbed sleep. But the quality of your sleep, you're tired during the day. You know, 8 o'clock at night, you're looking for bed. 8 o'clock at night, way too early. You know? You're sleepy during the day. You struggle driving the car. I don't need to go on about sleep problems. I'm sure you're aware of them. So, if you trot off to the doctor, the doctor says, oh, you snore at night, you're tired during the day, you've probably got sleep apnea. Didn't you know there's an epidemic of it going around in Australia? So they sign you up for a sleep clinic. We've got to study it. We'll study it and then we'll fix you. So you go off and have a sleep study. How many people have had a sleep study here? How many have had more than one? Okay. Who's anyone booked in for one? Hasn't had it yet. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. Um, so we go off to a sleep clinic. Do you know, 10 years ago, there was only one sleep clinic in Australia at the Epworth Hospital in Richmond. Now there's over 120. We, are, we have more per capita. We lead the world. But then, of course, there was a gentleman in Sydney that discovered a machine and started working for a company, and now they're the biggest company in the world in this area. So off we go to the sleep clinic. And here they measure our sleep. Oh, lots of science involved in sleep. So they wire you up, because right? all the electrical charges that go on while you're sleeping in your brain. So they wire you up and they put stuff on your legs to measure any leg movements. And uh, they measure your oxygen with, on your finger or here. Okay? And they measure your sleep. If you can get to sleep with all that stuff on you, and then they measure any, the frequency and duration of any apnea. How often you stop breathing and for how long. And the, the other thing they measure is 
I don't know whether you're aware, but there are these, they say there's these five stages of sleep. That when we sleep, we cycle through these different stages. Lots of science involved in sleep. Stage one, two, three, four, and five REM, rapid eye movement. And of course, they say that the best quality sleep comes from the time you spend in the non REM deep stages, in other words, three and four stage. Okay? So then they give you a report you've got mild, severe, or very severe sleep apnea. Now, if you've got mild and you're lucky, they might say stop smoking, lose a bit of weight. Anyone heard that? Yeah. So if someone does happen to have a few extra kilos and they lose a substantial amount of kilos, it can improve their sleep apnea. Have you heard that? Most people have something called obstructive sleep apnea, OSA. There is an obstruction in your airways, usually in your neck, you know, where it blocks up an obstruction. Stop breathing, breathing. Get the idea? Stop breathing. Air can't get through. Breathing. OSA. 97% of people with sleep apnea supposedly have OSA. There's a small proportion have central sleep apnea. And they say that some people have a combination. Now, what they used to offer people with this is an operation. Chop out this bit, okay? Very, thankfully, they don't do that anymore. All right? Very rarely. So, what they offer most people with severe or very severe sleep apnea is to use a CPAP machine. A constant positive air pressure, CPAP. How many people here are using a CPAP machine? Every night? When you can. <laughs> okay. All right. What, it, what this is a CPAP machine is a mask that fits over your nose with a tight seal. Okay, so no air can leak. There's a tube fitted to a pump that blows air under pressure into your nose as you breathe at night. They're called NCPAP. They should be nasal. There are some full face ones, but they should be nasal. Sometimes there's air tubes that go straight into your nasal passages. Now, and what happens is it blows air under pressure, constant positive air pressure. This is the way it works. Here's your body stopping breathing at night. You turn on the CPAP machine and... Get the idea? Constant all the time, positive that direction. Air pressure pushes the holds your air tubes apart, stops it from blocking. Get it? it? Provides what they call a pneumatic splint. Okay? Dilation by air pressure, however you want to hear it. Now, here's our happy couple here with their his and her CPAP machines. Okay? Now, many people find these things very uncomfortable. Uh, they're obviously very intrusive at night. You know, they can make a noise, they can disturb partners, you can bump them get a blast of air, but there's new models coming out all the time. You can upgrade and buy new models, variable speed, humidifiers. They can be very, very expensive, let alone the replacement parts that you have to do. But if you can use them, they will stop the apnea occurring and allow you to get down to deeper sleep and you get a better quality sleep. Okay? But the problem is, people find that they are now dependent on a CPAP machine. Okay? They don't even pretend it's going to get better, but it just stops it happening and allows you to sleep. Now, and, and in fact, what happens is in time, maybe six months, 12 months, two years, it doesn't work as well. They start to still get tired even using the CPAP machine. Often it gets torn off during the night. And the reason is, if it's not working as well after a while, it means it needs adjusting. There's one adjustment on a CPAP machine. It's the force of the air blowing at night. Guess which way it has to get adjusted in time? Only ever stronger, yeah. Do you know what your pressure is, sir? Do you know what your pressure is of your CPAP? About nine. About nine. That's, a good, that's good. Okay. Often they start at uh, four, to, sometimes four to six, but often six to eight. Then they go to eight to ten, and then ten to twelve, and I've had people up in the twenties even. Very strong pressure. And the reason is, in time, the CPAP machine doesn't fix the problem, it just stops your body doing it against your body's defence. And in time, what happens, because it has to be turned up, just like these drugs here, they, they, they maintain that incorrect breathing, so your body tries harder, and so you have to increase the pressure. 
to force it open even more. Okay? This diagram I'm going to use to explain what really happens uh, when you have sleep apnea. Now this was published by Mary Birch, a potato practitioner actually, and a registered nurse in, in Australian nursing about two and a half years ago. There's a diagram in the middle. Now if you want to get Mary's article with the case study that went through it, a lot more detail I recommend you do, you go to my website. It'll be on the front in red, potatohealth.com.au. Go to sleep apnea and snoring, you can download a three page PDF where you can read all about this. So here we've got, it starts here with hyperventilation. This is the cause of sleep apnea, hyperventilation, over breathing. Now first of all you're snoring. When the breathing gets worse, you get into this area here. Okay. A lot of people with snoring, the first thing I'll ask them, are you tired during the day? If they say no, oh good, it's just early stages. But the breathing gets worse, you're into here. When you over-breathe like this, your body, hour after hour, loses this carbon dioxide. Quite a lot. The carbon dioxide, we blow it off. Okay? There's no carbon dioxide in here. Gases try to equalise. Now, carbon dioxide, look, if you don't get this, think of a bottle of Coke. Or ladies, think of a bottle of bubbly. Okay, a bottle of bubbly. The bubbles in the bubbly, or in the bubbles in the Coke, do you know what that is? It's carbon dioxide, right? Under pressure in the bottle. When you release the pressure by taking the lid off, you hear pfft, because the gases are trying to equalise, because you've exposed the gas under higher pressure to the atmosphere where there's virtually no pressure of carbon dioxide. If you leave the lid off, what happens to the Coke? It goes flat as, doesn't it? Okay? We're a bit like that. <laughs> we're over-breathing incorrectly, where our body loses the... We're not really bottles of Coke, but you get the idea, right? Well, carbon dioxide is carbonic acid. Our body's chemistry goes in the wrong direction. You know, acid, alkaline, all that sort of stuff. The pH goes in the wrong direction. It's called respiratory alkalosis. You can look it up and read about it. It's a bit beyond this. The Bohr effect kicks in. You know, the Bohr effect states is when you've got low levels of carbon dioxide, our body's not getting the right amounts of oxygen. The oxygen's sticking in the blood and our oxygen saturations, if you've had a sleep study, plummet. Now the body craves oxygen. You're breathing in a way that's causing you a lack of oxygen. You don't have the propensity to asthma to wake you up. So your body stops you breathing like that. It's your body's defence against the way you're breathing, blowing off all this carbon dioxide, resulting in lack of oxygen. It's not a very nice defence, is it? Why is it a defence? Well, when you stop breathing, no gas can continue to be lost from your body to the atmosphere, yeah? No gas can exchange from your body to the atmosphere. But you're not dead. While you stop breathing, internal metabolism, respiration is still going on. External stop, but internal is still going on. And of course, while you stop breathing, your body's always producing this carbon dioxide. So the level of carbon dioxide starts to rise because you're not losing it while you stop breathing. The pH goes back in the right direction. The Bohr effect kicks in again. You've got a bit more carbon dioxide now building up. So your body releases a bit more oxygen. And so you start breathing again. But whenever you hold your breath for any length of time, a long length of time, the next breath is a big breath. And it's a gasp and it wakes you up, or it almost wakes you up. It certainly prevents you from cycling down to these deeper quality levels of sleep. Okay? So what do you do? You start breathing again. And so this happens again. You lose the carbon dioxide. And then because of this, this very bad thing happens again, and so you stop breathing. And the carbon dioxide builds up, and then you... Around and around you go all through the night. Look, the earlier you go to bed, the earlier you go to bed breathing like this, the worse you're going to be tomorrow. The worse you're going to be tomorrow. This is very exhausting. This is hard work. <laughs> to overcome sleep apnea, we have a very different approach. Instead of selling you an expensive, possibly uncomfortable mask to wear on your face for the rest of your life, keeping the condition at the same time, after the horse has bolted, we attack the cause by addressing the breathing, by retraining the way you breathe. It starts by changing the way you breathe during the day. It takes five sessions over five, and very, very, very quickly 
your body starts to breathe more normally, your body's getting more oxygen, the apnea stop. You might go through a period of snoring, but that's overcome very quickly as well, and you can overcome it forever. If you are using a CPAP machine and you've used one last night, keep using it. I'm not telling anybody to stop using them. We treat it as prescribed medication, which it is, and we have a careful way of weaning you off and measuring your breathing. And then we have periods of time to observe sleep where, you, where, you, where you're sleeping will we start to wean you off without the machine, and then very quickly you can come off. 90% of people who are using a CPAP, even if you've been using it every night for years, 90% of people are safely free of the machine forever by Thursday this week. By Thursday, 90%. The remaining people who take longer, they might have multiple medical conditions, taking lots of medication for other conditions. The, the, the mask might be a full face, very high volume, can take them a little bit longer. Okay, so let me just finish by telling you about the course this week and uh, explaining how it goes and then um, let you all go. Who would like one of these? It came to enrolment form yeah. plus details about... Would you like to pass these on to these people? One, two, three, one. Oh, naughty people in the back row here. Give them one, two. I'm sure. There you go. Because of him, eh? Yeah. Okay. Everyone got one? He's got one, yeah. So in here, you take this home and have a read about it. On the front is my website and my contact on that. So if you've got any questions, say tomorrow morning, this afternoon, later on, you think about this, whatever. Now, what is the course? What is it all about? Well, what it's all about is changing the way you automatically breathe. It's not just one little technique, breathing little technique that you do for a few minutes. It's about changing the way our body's automatically breathing. So it's made up of education about breathing. What sort of education? Well, education like this. Okay? Education like this. Subtle lifestyle changes. I'm going to get you to change the way, subtly, the way you cough and the way you breathe when you exercise, the way you breathe when you talk, little things like that, little subtle little things you have to change. Keeping your mouth closed is an example of breathing through your nose. Clearing your nose correctly instead of blowing and blowing and blowing is an example of a subtle lifestyle change. And the third method that we use is breathing exercises that are designed to increase your body's tolerance to carbon dioxide. And these exercises are done sitting in a chair if you're an adult and uh, walking around if you're under 18, if you're a child. Kids need to walk around when they do theirs. Now these exercises you will take you about, <coughs> you'll be expected to do them at home as well. And at the start of the week, tomorrow, it'll be taking you an extra, an extra half an hour a day. And by the end of the week, they'll be taking about an hour and a quarter extra a day. But not in one sitting, just in these little 10 minutes at night before you go to bed in the morning spread through the day. And you'll be expected to continue the method, these exercises and the method, for at least another month so that your breathing gets back to a nice level and becomes automatic. Learning to breathe again, breathe correctly, is a bit like learning to play a simple piece of piano. Learning to ride a push bike again. Learning to drive a car again. At first it's awkward, you make mistakes, but eventually it becomes automatic. Remember when you first learned to drive a car, you couldn't even steer. Now I'm sure you don't think when you get to a corner, you just automatically put the blinker on and do it automatically. Okay, so it's a bit like that. Now the course has to be done on consecutive days. You can't do it one day a week. Now I come to the eastern part of Melbourne three times a year. And this is the last week of the three weeks I've been here now. And I'll be back in November. The course this week, though, will be in this room at 7 o'clock each night this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If you can't make one day, then if it's Friday, then you can pick up the Friday later on. Uh, if you speak to me, I'll, I'll take you on anyway. Um, if not, if you're going to miss Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday, it's probably not worth it. Better to wait until you can do it properly. So if tomorrow night, for example, you know, there's a TV program you just can't miss, you know, the final of Dancing with the Stars or something is on, you need to get to it, OK? You can come to Roeville at one o'clock and then tomorrow night, the next night, you, right, you can mix and match during the week according to your circumstances. There's never an easy time to find another three, four days, of hour and a half because of our busy lifestyles, but we've got to be careful. We've got the rest of our lives to work. We've got the rest of our lives to do things, okay? And this can really be a big change to your health for the rest of your life. Now, if you wish to do the course at any one of those times, what I need you to do is to fill out this form 
and bring it back 15 minutes before the start date on one of those Tuesdays. That's all you need to do. There's no decisions tonight. Go home, talk to your partners, all that sort of stuff. And this is a little bit about your, your personal medical history, that's all. Because subtly we change the exercises depending on your medical background, what medications you're taking, things like that. The youngest person I teach is five. The oldest person I've taught was 90, 89, and that gentleman did very well. I've taught one quadriplegic and two through interpreter. Okay, so anyone can learn this. It does take a little bit of application, but anyone can learn this. Okay? Now, the cost of the course is $595 for an adult. For under 18, it's $495. And if, if, if you have a child that you wish to, uh, to learn, and we turn around kids very quickly. If you've got kids with asthma, don't wait in hope that they're going to grow out of it. Often they don't grow out of it, they just grow up. And when a kid grows up, he stops running around, yeah? The older we get, the less exercise we do. We shouldn't, but we do. That's, that's often the case, okay? Um, but the kid, uh, under 18 has to be accompanied by an adult. They don't pay, obviously, just, just to be with them. Um, the cost of the course is $595 for an adult. It's $495 for under 18. Now, if a second dependent family member does it at the same time, say a husband and wife or a father and son, whatever, then they, the second person gets a 50% discount. So if a couple does it, the first one's 595, the second one's just under 300, okay? If they do it at the same time. Now, we take cash, we take check, we take Visa, we take MasterCard. Now, um, so there's money involved. I've tried to explain to you why you're not going to get this through Medicare. You're not going to get it. Well, most health insurance don't pay. There are some. If you're with Australian Unity or um, Grand United, there's a small rebate. You have to bring me your card for that to tell me. But the others are Medibank Private, Advantage Plus Extras. There's a catch-all of $100 for singles and $200 for couples that you can use. If you're with um, Defence Health, Commonwealth Health Funds, Teachers Health Fund, um, that's about all, I think. They pay a rebate. If your health fund won't, then you, if you can be bothered, you can write them a letter in six weeks' time with a case study and your receipt. That forces it to go into an assessor where they have to make a decision and sometimes people will get um, a rebate, if you can be bothered. All right. If you, that's how we first got recognised by Grand United, which was the first one a year ago. Now, so there is money involved, but thankfully you're sitting down. I'm going to tell you now something that you need to be sitting down when someone tells you. I will guarantee the results. And the guarantee, medical thing, guarantee, you need to be sitting down when someone tells you this can't be true. There must be a catch here. The guarantees wording is here, and all it is is this, providing you turn up each day and apply the method as instructed and continue to apply it for at least another month. And if you've had no progress within that month, you, you need to have worked with me during that time. And if you've had no improvement after a month, then I'm not interested in taking money from people who don't get better. So you can ask for your money back. Okay? So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Have a think. Oh, there's one other thing. If you do the course this week and you would like your partner to come with you as support, your partner, I'm assuming your partner's not doing it for their own health, then I encourage that. By all means, you can have your partner coming. I encourage that. So your partner can sit in at no charge. Okay? By the way, when you, when you pay, it includes any follow-up in the future and so on. Okay? So your partner can attend if they wish. They don't have to, but if, if, if you wish them to. Providing the partner behaves themselves, that's the only thing, and lets me do the teaching, okay? All right, so that's it. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'll be here for a little while packing up, so if you have any burning questions, obviously if you can't do it this week, I understand. Just make sure that your name and address is down there if you want me to send you notice. Um, thank you for coming. Just before I go, just for my planning, you don't have to make up your mind now, but if you just give me an indication, who's thinking of doing the course this week with me this week? Okay, thank you. Well done. All right. I look forward to uh, working with you to improve your health, and thanks for coming. Good night. <laughs>